Please welcome Janice. Thank you very much, Brad. Pleasure to be here. And everything's working. This is the quickest turnaround I've ever done, so smooth sailing here. So happy to be here, and I feel very humbled following two of the people who'd been in the program that I'm about to tell you about who just presented here. Mandy and Christine, you, you'd rocked it, wonderful work. I'm here after them. I'm following them to speak to you about the program that I have created with multiple collaborations at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And I thought I'd start out and tell you why we were doing this. It's a postgraduate certificate program devised for medical physicians, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, social workers, licensed clinical psychologists, ordained clergy and commissioned chaplains, and a variety of professionals to work after all the research that you've been hearing about goes forward further and further in the development, particularly of psilocybin and MDMA, that we see the need for thousands of therapists trained in particular those two medicines, so I'll speak t to that as we go along. But the reason we're doing this is we train many, many therapists every year, 250, and we're supporting this renaissance, as you've been hearing about here and elsewhere, in FDA and the European Medical Agency's approval of psilocybin is moving forward very quickly in the UK and EU as we speak. And I already told you about the people in our program. It lasts for 180 hours, and it takes place over eight months. And it's uh, guided by principles that I have uh, published in a recent journal article in the fall. And who are we working with? The Council for Spiritual Practices was convened by Bob Jesse who is a mover and shaker and leader in the field and did some of the earlier uh, support financially and philosophically of research in psilocybin back in the early 90s. Uh, Betsy Gordon is another one who did that in helping research get started by Charlie Grobe, which is the earliest research in psilocybin in this particular era in the early 90s. Uh, the Hefter Research Institute funds psilocybin research here in the U.S. MAPS, you all know about MAPS is a co-sponsor of this program here this weekend, and the USONA Institute is a new NGO that's funding psilocybin research as well as other research in psychedelics. And this is a list of the folks who are teaching with us. Dr. Tony Bossa, she'll have the pleasure of hearing speak tomorrow. Uh, many of these people are known names to you at universities across this country. Some elders in the program of research here as well. And then we have local experts who are teaching in our program. We're in San Francisco. I forgot to tell you where we were. So these are the people who are students in the program and comprise the graduate classes. This, we're in our current third year right now in our program, and I tend to draw people who could relate to this cartoon up here. Um, if you can't see it from the back, I'll read it for you. This is a therapist sitting with a lizard. It's actually a chameleon, a wannabe chameleon, <coughs> a wannabe chameleon who's on a couch. The shrink is saying, listen, you've got to relax. The more you think about changing colors, the less chance you'll succeed. Shall we try the green background again? Excuse me, I'm pausing here for a moment of agua. So this scenario is one that symbolically many therapists in the room could relate to. We have tools in psychotherapy. I'm a clinical psychologist of over 30 years and I've sat often holding very quietly my frustration on behalf of my client who is ha having a supreme difficulty changing and they really want to. And so this is a frustration for us often as therapists and certainly for our clients. So people who come into this program tend to be going like, what else can I do? 
what else can I do in my mental health or my medical practice? So what we're teaching them are two things, to have a new knowledge base and a new skill base for their future practice. And we teach them about the design strategies in primarily MDMA and psilocybin research, but we do speak to the ayahuasca research and the ibogaine research that's going on and previous research being done by uh, folks on the East Coast and in Europe on LSD and, and uh, mescaline we speak a bit about as well. We talk from the anthropological point of view of how humans have been using psychedelics for eons in community building and in healing. And we speak with the students about neuroscience and the pharmacology of psychedelics because we believe that's important for them to understand what the mechanisms are, of action are from a physiological point of view. And as far as skill development goes, we teach them specialized methodologies for use in psychedelic sessions as well as in prep and integration, which you've heard about already today. And we teach them competence in set and setting, which I haven't heard anyone speak to exactly yet, so I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of that. That's everything from the dosage to the intentions of the participant or the client, the intentions of the practitioners and researchers, to what kind of photographs or paintings are on the wall, how comfortable the sofa is, and what type of integration of the work is done thereafter. And I called 60 years of literature that is extant and available about competencies as seen from the 1950s of therapists. First one, that's a universally voiced competency for therapists, is an abiding, what I call an empathetic abiding pe presence, that the therapist knows how to sit in the room during prep and integration, but particularly during the sessions and sitting quietly, letting the person's inner healer do the work it's doing, aided and abetted by the particular psychedelic they're working with. And the therapist's job is to enhance the trust that the person has in their own healing capacity and to enhance, of course, the trust in the therapist because it's ultimately a relational experience is happening in the room. Spiritual intelligence on the part of the therapist is that they are comfortable with their own inner awareness. They're aware of the sacredness within themselves and beyond themselves in whatever way they see that, and that they're comfortable with difference of opinion about that in terms of what the client or the participant may or may not think about their own sacredness. And we want them to know about the knowledge of physical and psychological effects of psychedelics. This has been universally spoken about since the 50s. We want our therapists to have an ethical integrity in that it's all about the client's experience of the medicine. It's not about what we're doing in the room. We're an adjunct. We're a handmaiden to the relationship that the person is having with the medicine itself. It's really important for us as therapists to learn this for this particular model of treatment. And lastly, we need to know complementary techniques such as guided imagery, hypnosis, holotropic breath work, teaching our clients mindfulness to integrate the work or to prepare themselves for the work. These are the major things we're teaching our therapists based on the history of discourse around this. So there's six modules we have, and in the, for the sake of time here, I'll go through them quickly. We teach about research, which I've shared with you already. We teach about how people have transformed consciousness over millennia. We teach about these competencies I just shared with you. We have our students go through hypnosis, guided imagery, role playing, uh, observation of films of psychedelic and MDMA sessions so they can see what it's actually like to experience a, a pseudo uh, moment of an altered state as well as sitting with someone who's undergoing that. So they partner with one another, they practice being sitters for each other. And then lastly in the mentoring we have each student 
partner with one of the mentors that I had on that list of the teachers in the program, as well as a wealth of other very well-known scholars and researchers and practitioners in the field. And we asked them to do volunteer work if they haven't already worked with people who are in altered states, such as joining crisis response teams, working in a detox center, working in hospice with the bereaved, working at the Zendo uh, at Burning Man. And I wanted to give you a summary. You can take a look here of the demographics of our trainees. We've got it currently and have graduated the sum of 141 professionals. You can see the types of people we've had with us already. Their average age is 39 years old. They uh, tend to be very well uh, experienced folk. You can see here that uh, they have, oh, I left this out. I will share with you that our average years since licensure is 15. 15 years since they've been licensed. And uh, first year, three people came out of retirement, two physicians and one nurse, in order to be in this program. They re-upped on their license. They never thought they'd see the day, after having been in practice for 35 years, that they'd be able to do this kind of work. Uh, we have, uh, we've gotten scholarships, thank goodness, from the generosity of many donors for scholarships for people who identify as LGBTQI or people of color. We want to see more diversity in our field and we're working hard to help that happen. And you can imagine what a great group of people like that can be like. You saw two speak right before me. So here's the outcomes. We were told uh, to be very careful with admissions. So I was a former dean of faculty and we have a very strict admissions process that we do. And a key benefit that our students have cited for us when they graduate is they love the community. Many felt like they were coming out of the closet as a physician or a nurse or a psychologist saying, I want to learn about psychedelic assisted therapy. And they've created communities that they've continued building since they've graduated. 14 are already working with Hefter, USONA, or MAPS. I found that doing some online learning on the more didactic theoretical material was very helpful. This year we have 57% of the folks in our class are from outside of California and represent five different countries aside from the United States and we'll continue to do a lot of this online for the, for the benefit of those folks. And I feel very happy about this outcome in their report in their exit interviews they describe having a deepened sense and trust of the power of love within the participant within the client to come into a healing place they witnessed it in themselves they witnessed it in each other they were taught about this by multiple different teachers and many have suggested to me that they unlearned things they learned in medical school and in their PhD program to revivify the idea that we do have a healing mechanism within us and that there's a pure feeling of love that we can experience in meditation, fasting, long, long yoga retreats, wilderness, solo journeys, and with psychedelics under right set and setting. I'm really happy to report that to you as an outcome. I feel like we're helping revivify the hopefulness among psychologists and psychiatrists for being able to help people in their own healing. And I'm leaving you with two quotes before I take some questions. Well, this is first one's from Albert Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. And then lastly, from Thomas Merton, theologian, the ultimate cure, as many ancient and modern psychologies of depth have asserted, comes from love and not from logic. It takes a certain courage to imagine that these words have truth to them because we're a species that likes to know concrete answers. I think these altered states of consciousness helps us realize we're much bigger than we are. We're much more capable of healing ourselves, our relationships, and as several people have pointed out already, healing how we relate to this planet, our dear home. 
and I'm very happy to be training people with the hopes that rescheduling will happen and teachers in De Decatur, pipe fitters in Chicago, accountants in Boston, retirees in Houston will be able to be healed more and more with things that we don't have right now in psychology and psychiatry, but we're about to. Thank you all for your support of this. All right. Thank you very much, Janice. We have time for one question. Uh, firstly, I applaud your work, and I'm wondering if there's a place for somatic work in oh. working with uh, psychedelic. Yes, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that as one of the complementary techniques that we recommend our students learn if they don't already know it. It's utilized quite a bit in the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, and Michael and Annie Mithofer, who are brilliant teachers, teach our students about it. Yeah, very important. Um, so my question is, um, to what extent is uh, CIIS engaging with um, indigenous uh, teachers in the Americas, you know, considering that a lot of this education is around plant medicine, uh, what is CIIS's relationship to indigenous healers, and um, is CIIS looking into higher uh, uh, educators of color so that applicants can have a relationship on a, a certain uh, understanding of cultural competency and cultural relevancy of experience when learning about um, uh, the, the ways of healing? Yeah, thank you, that's an excellent question. I spent, I would say, six months meditating with that question and found that with teaching people to do research-based design protocols that I had to make a cut on who was teaching and what we focused on. So we decided after lots of consultation to focus primarily on MDMA and the psilocybin, which comes as you are so well informed about it with magic mushrooms. So I'm walking a delicate line here. I was told by some of the researchers that they really want to participate in a program that's forwarding the FDA approved studies and that they try to look like this in front of the FDA. So it's like really hard, but I, I, my heart is with you and I hope, as I told Michael Pollan when he asked me the same question when he was doing his article that came out in the New York Times, you all should read that, it's a great article that came out in the middle of May, that as soon as things open up more, so will this program in multiple, multiple, multiple ways. I already have a list of indigenous people I'd like to invite. And thank you for holding that, and thank you for reminding me I'm holding it as well. It's really important. And Thanks, Mr. Jones. Good for Jones. Yeah.